Here we go. We're just about to go live with YouTube. And here we go. Great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our next installment of yeah, Chasing Lullabies, uh, which is, yeah. Welcome to our next installment of Chasing Lullabies. It is wonderful to see so many of you back here on the channel, and I'm really looking forward to tonight's session, um, which is the origin story of Ruth, with the rather uh, fun uh, catch phrase, incest seduction and um harlotry just all a few things that, that we will be discussing this evening in the origin story of ruth which really puts anakin skywalker's story to shame uh, disney really shouldn't have bought the rights to the lucasfilm saga they should have bought the rights to the bible because they would have had a much better time of it selling this story it's amazing and so we're going to begin now remember chasing lullabies is we are working under the banner, under the intention and the invitation not to be relating to these stories as lullabies, not to be relating to them as simply um, stories or ideas that we've heard about so frequently that we cease to think about them anymore. I didn't bring Jemima this week to, uh, to rock to sleep while she fell and tumbled from the tree, whilst I, unbeknownst to me, sang to her to her death. Um, but rather just to remind ourselves that that is what we're trying to do each week. We are trying to chase away the lullabies and welcome into, uh, welcome into our community and into our lives a new era of really adult learning and, and questioning of those favourite um, favorite episodes, favourite events that we have in Tanakh. And what better story to think about than the book of Ruth? And really... Um, this week, I want to begin just by opening the quite opening up to you for questions about Ruth, and I want to ask one fundamental question and see what you think, which is why on earth would we read the book of Ruth on Shavuot? What purpose does it seem to hold? Shavuot is the commemoration of the giving of the Torah. It is the day that we get married to God. The Torah is our wedding document. We now engage in the ultimate relationship with him. It's an experience unlike any other. We see voice, we see sounds, we hear, we hear um, visions. We have this synesthetic synesthesia experience. It's an unbelievable revelation. It's the bedrock of everything that we have in Judaism that we have now been given the Torah and chosen as his people. So why do we choose something so pedestrian, so maybe plebeian, so boring, so basic as the it's not. It's not. It's not okay. because when we were given the Torah, that's what the beginning of our Jewish journey okay. of being Jews as we know it, as we practice it, etc. And with Ruth, this is the point at which she takes upon herself or wishes to take upon herself the uh, uh, concept, for want of a better word, of being Jewish. So it's actually reflecting in a, okay, on a much smaller scale yeah. the becoming Jewish. Okay, great. So Susie's couldn't couldn't bear the build up of the question it was getting too dramatic she had she had to go in and, and that's great because i love that i love that susie so um um she suggested that the issue here the, the the reason that we are talking about the reason that we're talking about ruth is because she converted she chose to become part of this story and what an amazing and courageous thing that she did to convert to to uh, and, and dramatically so. Um, if I'm gonna I mean, let me just pull up the text where she, that, that that amazing um, statement that she makes to that she makes to Naomi. Um, I'm just gonna point. Yeah. So if we go to chapter one, so uh, Susie, I'm just showing the a beautiful chapter, the beautiful 
point point where where Ruth she says that she wants to be to be part part of uh, God's people. Mm. And Ruth says, don't, don't urge me to leave you, to turn back. Do not, do not send me away, right? So Orpah has been sent away. Ruth and Orpah, the Naomi's two daughter-in-laws, just to kind of get ourselves into the, to the story of Bethlehem, the backwaters of Bethlehem. Uh, there's this man called Elimelech. He's got, a, he's got a wife called Naomi. And they've gone, they've left the land of Israel because it's been, there's been a famine. They've got two sons, Machlon, which means disease, Kilion, which means pestilence, here little disease, here little pestilence. They go away to live outside of the land of Israel to seek more fertile pastures and more um, lucrative lands. And um, they, the, the sons of Elimelech take Moabite women, they marry out. They take Moabite women as their wives. And Elimelech and, and Elimelech dies, and Machlon dies, and Kilian dies. All the men are dying, and Nomi is bereft. She's lost her husband. She's lost her sons, and she's now got her two daughters-in-law, her two Moabite daughters-in-law, who have joined, so to speak, the family. And she says, "She says, I'm going back to Israel. I'm broken. I'm bitter. I'm going to send you away." And Orpah, after the initial kind of reticence to leave her mother-in-law. She decides to leave, but Ruth will not be persuaded. And she says, and this, this is the beautiful line, amos, where you die, I will die. Vesham ekaver, and there I will be buried. Ko Hashem li. This is this and many more Hashem will do to me. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you be, I will be. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And here we are. Do not let me leave you to turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. What an amazing statement of faith. She has decided she is going to become a member, a proud card-carrying member of the Jewish people. And so on Shavuot, the day of the giving of the Torah, we celebrate Ruth's life, Ruth's choice rather, to become a convert and to join the Sinai experience. Okay, Susie, I love the answer but I think there might be a problem with it. So, so I wanna see if anyone else can, can wonder with me, what, what could be the problem of this being the reason that we read about Ruth on Shavuot? By the way, there are other answers. There are other answers why Ruth is read on Shavuot. Some people say, you know, there was the wheat harvest in, in the story of Ruth. And so there's also a wheat harvest at the time of Shavuot, but it doesn't seem to be uh, particularly particularly compelling it's rather a tangential reason but what's if we're going to take Susie's Susie's answer it's a, it's, a, it's a serious answer um sorry for the uh, background noise he obviously didn't get the lullaby sufficiently um so if we're going to take if we're going to take the uh Susie's suggestion what, what might be a problem with it if it's all about conversion anyone no I'll give you a little clue there's four chapters to the book of Ruth and the conversion story happens in chapter one. And we read all four chapters on Shavuot. So if we're going to, if we're going to say that it's all about conversion, then let's leave out three other chapters. It would actually, it would make sure much more speedy, much more efficient. Um, but if the whole focus is on Ruth becoming Jewish, Ruth deciding to leave the Moabite lands and to become a Jew and to join the Sinai experience. So then that's where we should leave it. We should leave it with her declaration of faith that we read together from the text that, um, that she wants to join and become one of Naomi's people. We don't see that. We see that actually there's an enormous, a huge, that's almost the beginning of the story, but it's certainly not the end. And actually the main part of the story is what happens next, that they go to the land of Israel and they're poor and they're penniless. Naomi and Ruth and there is a member of Elimelech's family Naomi's late husband his name is Boaz he's a wealthy landowner and somehow the family start getting mixed up now Ruth goes to look for crops in Boaz's field he takes care of her then there's a there is a something else that happens here and there's something called Yibam but before we get to that let's just Therefore, try and tweak our sails as to what's the purpose of the Ruth story on Shavuot. It can't simply be about conversion. It can't be about a book about Ruth the convert. 
it must be about the life of Ruth the convert, or rather what Ruth the convert does. That must be the real focus of why we read it on Shabbat, what, what Ruth does, because that takes up the main proportion of the book. So yes, she became a convert, and yes, that's incredible, and yes, that's amazing, but that can't be where it's limited, otherwise we'd stop there. So we have to read on, we have to find out what does she do, what is so critical about what she does. And ultimately what she does is she invites Boaz to join her, to join her in something called Yibam. Now, Yibam is a concept or mitzvah in the Torah. It's translated in many places as levirat marriage, L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E, which is, I, I don't even know what levirat marriage means, but I think, I think the idea of, the, 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 the idea, the, the idea of Yibam is as follows. And it's brought down in the Torah as a mitzvah, but it existed before the Torah was given. And the concept is that when a person dies, let's say a man dies without having been able to have any children with his wife. There was something lacking in his ability to continue his legacy in this world. And so there is a mitzvah upon the rest of the family, particularly this person's brothers, to marry his widow. And so with her have a child that will be in the name of the deceased. That will almost be like the surrogate child of the person that has died so that there should still be a legacy of his name, of his soul, of his soul root in this world through the child that is born between his wife and his brother. And that is Yibam, and that's what Ruth seeks to achieve with Boaz, that she's been married to Elimelech's son. She's been married to Machlon. And she wants to continue the name of her husband, the name of Elimelech, the name of his household. How is she going to do that? She's become Jewish, but she still doesn't have the ability to bring that Jewish family to continue into this world. And so she invites she invites Boaz in an act of kindness, an old man, Boaz. She invites him, an act of kindness, not to him, just to him, but an, an act of kindness to Elimelech and his family. Please, let us be partners in continuing the legacy of my husband's family. But he's I not related to her at all, is he? He's not related to her at all, no. She came from Moab and he came from Israel. They are and can can you pick some can you pick someone from out of the family to 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 fulfill the leverage uh, commitment? Boaz, Boaz is a thanks. Good question, Solly. So Boaz is a cousin. Boaz. Oh, he's related. Oh, that's right. He's related to okay. Elimelech. He's a cousin of Elimelech. Good question. Mm -hmm. So okay, okay. Um, but there's a problem with this um fairy tale that we've just spun because the method of bringing about yibum in this story uh doesn't seem so let's say rabbinic or maybe it does and that's quite a problem in this day and age but what happens what happens well it seems like boaz has been a bit reticent in the yibum department he's not he hasn't taken N ruth as a wife and so Naomi hatches a cunning plan. It's almost like Baldrick has been writing it for her. And this cunning plan is as follows. Ruth is to go to the threshing floor one evening after Boaz and his workers have had a hard day in the fields. And Boaz has drunk a little bit too much. And he's asleep in a sort of a semi-drunken stupor. And Ruth lies down next to him. So they cohabit. No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. You're jumping the gun. It's very. I know it's exciting. I know it's exciting. But wait a second. <laughs> um, so he lies. She lies down next to him, and uh, she lifts suggestively, sorry, but not fully suggestively. She lifts the covers by his legs, and to wake him up, and let him know that she's available. Okay. At that point, by the way, Solly, they don't actually um, consummate that yibum. It's all above board, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So it's a, it's a foreplay, basically. 
for sorry, uh, this Egyptian power, it's, it's very strong. Um, <laughs> no, it's not a foreplay, it's an invitation. It's an invitation, <laughs> and we have to see what the invitation is, and we're going to get there at the very end of the shear, so you're going to have to hold on for, with me for, for, for a few minutes. But I want to ask a question, which is that Solly is actually feeling out something very uncomfortable in this story. How can we say that Ruth is a heroine if she acts like this? You know, you're right. Susie was right that Ruth is amazing. She converts to become part of the Jewish people. Then Solly's very uncomfortable with this um, seduction story. It becomes... My wife's over here. She's already telling me that there's other places that we see seduction stories in the Torah, which we're going to talk about this evening. Do you want to join us, Shashan? Um, so, so, uh, but, but we're very uncomfortable with this. That's not, that's not the hero or the heroine that we originally dreamed of. We didn't think that it was going to be some steamy night on the threshing floor in Bethlehem. So what's going on? And if this is what the Book of Ruth is all about and why we read it on Shavuot, how are we to, we to make sense of that? And so the two main questions that we're going to ask this evening, which, by the way, are external questions. They're not questions about the specific wording of the text. They're questions that arise from the text and the way the text is positioned in our lit literature and liturgy is as follows. Question number one, why do we read the Book of Ruth on Shavuot? And question number two is what do we do with a seduction story? And so I'm going to I'd like to introduce us to a way of reading text or a way of being sensitive to text, which is going to help us to unpack um, what happened in this story. And this is to be sensitive for patterns in the Torah. We might call it in a uh, sort of academic sense, intertextuality, intertext between text, textuality, similarities. We're looking for similarities between different texts that appear in the Tanakh that appear in the written portion of our scriptures. You might kind of boil it down to the phrase, where have I seen this before? Maybe there's a kind of a sense of deja vu. When I read this story, it reminds me of other stories. Now, sometimes we have similar words. That's what we did last week in Chasing Lullabies. We looked at similar wording between the, the story, for example, of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, and the story of our Sinai of Mount Sinai and we saw remarkable parallels between the two texts and we held the two texts alongside each other and looked at words that appear in both stories. Here we're not looking today in this session we're not looking for similar words necessarily we're looking for similar themes, similar stories and so I want to invite us to wonder together and here I want to open it up to you that we have actually encountered two Yibam like stories, two stories where there's been an attempt to continue someone's name or someone's legacy at all costs, even though it thought it looked like that legacy was ended. Two stories that appear in the book of Genesis. And if we're going to think about where they might appear, just to give a clue, there are two main stories in the book of Genesis. One is the Abraham story, the whole story of our first forefather and everything that he did and built and that takes up a good portion of the of the book of Genesis and the other main component of the book of Genesis is the Joseph story and both of those stories are punctuated by seemingly non-related stories and both of them have yibum in as their heart what are those stories over to you Lot, Lot, Lot and his daughters who said that Jeff Jeff, amazing. Okay, so Jeff. Yeah, who's uh, Great, we've got the two stories. Okay, who said you're in Tamar? Dad. Dad, my dad said that. Okay, dad, that's. Uh, is it allowed for dad to take part? It's allowed for dad. Okay, so um, <laughs> so we've got we've got from you from you already the two stories that both have within them seduction. That both have within them yibum. Jeff's told us about Lot and his daughters, which strikes through the heart of the Abraham narrative. And dad, um, his, uh, uh, I can't say anything else. My dad said that um, the, 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 the Yehuda, the Judah and Tamar story that strikes through the Joseph narrative. So let's just speak those out. Both are interrupted by a Yibam like story. So just to put us back in the perspective of Lot, Lot was Abraham's nephew. Lot left Abraham, he departed. Um, Abraham went one way, Lot went the other. He went to the fertile plains 
near the, the city of Sodom and Sodom, and he went to live in that city. And the city of Sodom was uh, not good in the eyes of God. And God decided after a long conversation with Abraham about the uh, relative value of people that he might find there, I'm going to get rid of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he sends off his angels to that town. And we'll talk more about the story in detail. But after he's brought hail and fire and brimstone down upon the town and the angels are putting Lot and his wife and his daughters out with them and his wife faithfully looks back at the destruction of the town and becomes a pillar of salt and if you go down to the dead sea they say that there's a certain pillar down there which is labeled as lot's wife i don't know if that's simply a tourist attraction or whether that really was a pillar of salt is the pillar of salt that she became in any case lot and his daughters end up in a cave one night now lot knows lot knows that he is not the this this is not the oh, the destruction of the world this is the destruction of sodom of just just his town but his daughters don't know that his daughters think that actually these are the last human beings left on this planet and in an act of yibum like um quality in the sense that they want to propagate the legacy of humanity not just their their family but humanity because these are the only the only people left that they think now does what does lot know by the way there's an interesting book there's an, what does lot know does he know what's happening because they get him drunk they get him drunk now the torah when it's written has i don't know if you can see this over here has a word i'm going to try and get this to the camera but it might be a bit tricky it has a word which talks about the heaven getting up and it has a dot over the word so if you look over here normally the torah is written Without any any notation over the vault over here, there's a dot in the tire. That our sages tell us is that Lot didn't know what was going on, but he kind of knew what was going on when he got totally drunk, and he kind of knew that his daughters were doing something with him that wasn't um, above board. But in any case, there is a Yibum story where Lot impregnates his daughters in an act of incest. Uh, somewhat unwitting incest. And now, in their minds, humanity continues. It's Yibam by seduction. There's another story of Yibam by seduction, which occurs in the book of Genesis. And that is right again in the heart of the Joseph narrative, the Joseph saga, that after they've sold, the brothers have sold Joseph to the slave drivers and he's gone down to Egypt and their father Jacob is absolutely bereft at the loss of his son. So then we all of a sudden interrupt the narrative by talking about what happens to Judah, the man that orchestrated the sale of Joseph, the man that or made essentially his father go into a period of prolonged depression, grief and mourning. And Judah has two sons, Er, which is Ra backwards, which means little bad one, and Onan, which means little mourning. Onan is mourning. So he has two sons, again, interesting names. Machlon, Kilion, pestilence, destruction, Er, Onan, wickedness and mourning. And um, Er marries a beautiful lady called Tamar. And Er thinks she's so beautiful, he doesn't want her to get pregnant, and so does things that are wicked in the eyes of God, and he dies. And Yehuda, knowing the importance of continuing the legacy of his oldest son, instructs his second son, Onan, little morning, to marry Tamar. And Onan, knowing that this son or this child that they have won't be his own or be his older brothers, refuses to perform an act of kindness to his late deceased brother and refuses to impregnate his wife, Tamar. And so also performs an act that is wicked in front of the eyes of God and so dies too quite harsh but it happened tamar is now waiting because tamar ultimately wants to continue the line of her husband who is dead and her second husband who is dead how is she going to continue the line of her husband well yehuda has a third son judah has a third son his name is shayla and she's waiting and waiting for him to be married to her but it doesn't seem to be happening judah seems to be holding back withholding his son from tamar so tamar takes actions into her own hands 
and dresses up as a harlot and waits on the road and seduces Yehuda, demands from him certain payment which he can't quite manage to bring because he doesn't have a goat ready, and so takes instead his staff, his signet ring, and his cloak as a, as a um, payment in kind until the goat is paid for her services, and she seduces Yehuda so that she can carry on the legacy of her husband. So the daughters of Lot are involved in a yibum by seduction, and Tamar is involved in a yibum by seduction. And I'd like to suggest that both of these stories foreshadow and inform what happens in the Ruth story to help us answer our two questions. Why are we reading the book of Ruth and Shabbat and what are we to do with the seduction story? So if you see these patterns, these patterns that are appearing through it within our written scriptures, We've got a Yibam by seduction with a lot and his daughters, a Yibam by seduction with Yehuda and Tamar, and maybe even a Yibam by seduction with Ruth. We have to see what is linking these three stories. Everyone okay so far? Yeah? Okay. So let's begin. Actually, can I just do a little spoiler alert? I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert, okay, to tell you why these stories are also so critical. Because which nation does Ruth come from? She comes from the nation of Moab, of Moab. When Lot's first daughter had relations with her father in an act of yibum by seduction of incest, they had a son. That son was called Moab. So Ruth is from that line of yibum by seduction. She is born of that nation. Ruth, by the way, met another man, a man met a man called Boaz in this story. Boaz, who is he descendant of? He's a descendant, the seventh generation descendant of Peretz. Who's Peretz? He's Tamar and Yehuda's son. So Tamar and Yehuda had a son after that night, that fateful night when she was a harlot on the, on the side of the road. They actually had two sons. They had twins, Peretz and Zerach. Peretz. Peretz gives birth seven generations, generations later to Boaz. And so the arc of time of these two stories converges into the backwaters of Bethlehem in our story of Ruth. And so not only are they thematically linked in what happened, they are genealogically linked in the players who are here in the book of Ruth. So we really have to find out what these stories are about. So let's begin with the story of Lot. And what we're going to do for the next half hour is we're going to spend just a few, about 10 minutes on the Lot story, 10 minutes on the Yehuda and Tamar story, and then 10 minutes tying it together to seeing how they resolve themselves in the Ruth story. So let's go. God decides that Sodom is no longer a fit place for people to live. They've actually brought about a philosophy that is so twisted and so warped that it needs to be wiped off the face of this earth. We have to ask a question though. Again, we have to ask questions. We can't simply accept these things at face value. Why not simply destroy the town as soon as God says they are a wicked town? Just destroy them. What's the whole backwards and forwards, waiting for a while, speaking to Abraham, bargaining with Abraham, sending the angels in, and, and ultimately second question, why sending the angels? Even if you bargain with Abraham and you decide, wait for, let's see if there's 10 righteous people. So just, just do a survey. Why are you sending the angels? And why do the angels have to go in and spend a whole night with Lot? So let's find out what was going on in this story and what's really being built, what we are learning about the town of Sodom. And what we're going to find out is that the story of Sodom doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's juxtaposed with another episode in the Torah. And you might call the episodes it's juxtaposed with, with kindness incarnate, pure kindness, the story of ultimate kindness. What's that story? Well, Abraham has just circumcised himself um, on the command of God. He's entered into a covenant with God. He circumcised his family and he's sitting by the entrance to his tent on the third day after the operation. The third day is always the most painful day. OK, so uh, after breaking my pelvis, the third day. Most painful, actually, um, that my dad's here, the first day in the hospital with dad kind of watching me ride on the hospital bed, that was pretty painful too. But the third day for sure is painful. It's the, it's the most painful day after an operation. And Abraham is there. He's in great agony and pain. He's actually talking to God. 
and God's come to visit him because God visits the sick. Isn't that what you do when you have someone you love and they're unwell? You visit them. But Abraham sees some traveling Ishmaelites some traveling Arabs and he wants to offer them hospitality. So he says, excuse me, God, um, I've got a mitzvah to do. You've been looking after me. I've got to look after them. And he runs and he prepares them a lavish feast and he offers them kindness and hospitality. That's true kindness. Abraham's kindness was a kindness that flows from a good heart. Shoshana and I often joke um, that sometimes we meet good people, like just good people, people that you feel that they, through their very bones, they're just lovely, they're nice, they are overflowing with, with, with kindness, with love, with care. And Shoshana and I joke, we really wish we'd be like them. We really wish that it wouldn't have to be something that we try to do, that we wish to will to want to do. Wouldn't it be lovely just to be naturally kind, deeply kind? Well, Abraham was deeply kind. And the question when it comes to kindness always is, is it real or is it an imitation? Is it a twisting of kindness? You see, so Sodom's social policies were the opposite of kindness. And this is why we now have the Sodom episode just after the episode of ultimate kindness in the Torah. Their social policies were they had the most fertile land in the fertile crescent. And they restricted the bounty of their land to only that town. And any visitors that came, they would steal from and rape. That was the idea that they would take away, take away their possessions and take away their body's integrity. That is the social policies of Sodom. And there's a question here. How do we weigh the social policies of Sodom versus Abraham? It's almost like once Abraham has become so good in kindness, he points the finger of prosecution against anyone else who is the antithesis of that. And so by Abraham being so kind, now God says there's no space for the opposite of kindness, for anti-kindness in this world. And so Sodom is held to account and we have the bargaining between Abraham and God. Now, now Abraham is the arbiter of this, this, of this uh, situation because he's the one that introduced such kindness to the world. But let's check out Lot. Lot is, after all, from the family of Abraham. He's a nephew. Let's go down to Sodom. Let's find out what he's about. Does he still have the values of Abraham or has he assimilated the culture of his town? Is he now no longer kind or just a twisted kindness, a broken kindness? Well, on the one hand, the guests come, the angels come and Lot welcomes them in and prepares them a feast just like Abraham did when he welcomed them into his tent. But that night, the townspeople get wind of the fact that Lot has welcomed, has offered hospitality to visitors. That's against the town's social policies. And a murderous and raping mob comes to his door. And Lot says something which startles you when you read it. And we almost, again, we forget to think about it. But you read it and you're like, what is going on? Because Lot says, I'm not going to give you my guests. You can't rape them. But I've got two virgin daughters. Why don't you have some fun with them? And he throws them out the house or attempts to throw them out the house. Let have my daughters. It's there in the scripture. It's not even a medrash. It's not even in our rabbinic texts, which are helping us to unpack the story. It's there in the Torah. Lot says, I have two virgin girls. Don't take my guests, but take my daughters. Now, I'll tell you what. When I was being brought up and my parents are here so they can attest to that. They always taught me kindness starts at home. Kindness starts right here, right with your immediate family. You have to love them first, and then you can love friends, and then you can love community. Kindness can't start out there. We're ignoring the kindness that is due to one's closest, one's nearest and dearest. My mum is thinking he's forgotten his lesson. He keeps on doing that, but I'm not gonna, we're not going to get involved in land or family politics right now. <laughs> anyway... Um, my mouth's my wife's calling me an idiot. Anyway, um, what's going on? What's Lot done? Lot has inverted kindness. Kindness is meant to be starting at home and only first, and then only then offered to other people, and he's inverted it. And so he's really imitating kindness. He's not truly kind. He's not that wellspring of kindness flowing out like Abraham. He's just going through the motions. And ultimately. Kindness, when it's twisted, can even lead 
to incest can even lead to love to kindness that has no bounds so when incest is expressed in the torah when it talks about a brother having relations with a sister it's called chesed it's called kindness a brother and sister love each other they love each other so much i look at my own children my my my, my son is obsessed with his big sister my, my 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 daughter just wants to cuddle his baby her baby brother when she wakes up but love taken too far kindness which isn't well balanced well placed it's chesed it's kindness but it is twisted and from that twisted kindness comes a seduction in a cave one night when these two daughters of lot decide that they are the only humans left and so they must engage in incest and ultimately look their dad threw them out to the rabble the medrash actually says when he threw them out to the rabble god says uh, you're only doing that because you want them for yourself. There's a, something about Lot's action which doesn't seem so right. He wants to somehow take advantage of this twisted and warped kindness. And what's the legacy of twisted kindness? What's the legacy of the nation of Moab? And on this, we'll finish this part, which is that Moab, we're told we cannot marry, a Jew cannot marry a Moabite. Why can, they not, why can we not marry a Moabite? Because when we left Egypt, the Moabites did not offer us hospitality in the desert. And where else do we see Moab in the story of the Jews? When they came and seduced us in order to bring us away from God. So rather, Bilam, the prophet, couldn't curse us, but the Moabites could seduce us. And so we see something very interesting. The Moabites will not offer public kindness. They will not offer hospitality. But they will take private kindness, the privacy of a marital relationship, and twist it and make it public. Public kindness becomes private. Private kindness becomes public. It's the story of a nation who has been betrayed by kindness, who has lived with twisted kindness in their history and now continues that twisted kindness in their present. And from that nation of Moab comes Ruth, the Moabite. And so the first part of this story is of kindness gone wrong. But we noticed there was a second, a second story, a second story in the, in the book of Genesis, which was about seduction in Yibam. And that was the story of Yehuda and Tamar. How did that begin? That story began by Yered Yehuda Me'echov. That Yehuda went down from his brothers. Why did he go down? What does that mean that he went down? So let's look at a bit of text together. So we'll share screen again. And this time we're going to look over here at the book of uh, the story of Yehuda and Tamar in Genesis 37. It loads up. Oh, here we go. Sorry, I went at the wrong place. Okay, so this is the story of Joseph, and we're about to break the story of Joseph with Yehuda. Right. Here we go. And Judah went down from his brothers. So what does Rashi say on that? And we're going to read this Rashi together. By the way, this is Safaria. It's a great resource. It has uh, amazing, amazing uh, resources. Just you can open up the text as you go. So here's the Rashi. And it came to pass at that time. Why is this section placed here? Thus interrupting the section dealing with the history of Joseph. To teach that his brothers degraded him. They lowered him from his high position. Right, so Judah is the one who's meant to be the king. He's the lion. But when they saw what he'd done, when they saw their father's grief after the sale of Joseph, they said, you told us to sell him. If you had told us to send him back to his father, we would also have obeyed you. You misused your influence. You were the king. We listened to you. And now look what you've done to dad. You've destroyed him. Our sages tell us that, that, that Jacob was so distressed and so much in grief and loss after 
he felt he understood that Joseph had been killed, had died. Sorry, that he was he, the the Shekhinah left and the divine presence left, and he could no longer have prophecy. He was so deep in melancholy. And so the brothers they bring him down. That word the, the, by Yemed, he's brought down from his brothers. So, and we know when I related to you earlier the story of his sons marrying Tamar and finally Judah being seduced. But we didn't talk about the end of the story because Tamar has taken his coat, his signet ring and his staff. And now Tamar falls pregnant and Judah finds out about it. Now, she ultimately was meant to perform Yibam with his family. And even though he withheld his third son from performing Yibam with her, she wasn't meant to marry anybody else. And so he thinks that she has been sleeping around, which she kind of has just with him. Now, if you're Tamar at this point in time, you kind of have two options because Judah is the king of this area and he's just sentenced you to death. What's your option? Well, actually, the main, the, the real option is expose him. Expose him. Tell him he's the one that did it. Bring him down again. But she doesn't do that. And actually, what she does offers redemption, offers some sort of change. She says, have care enough. Recognize this. Now, if you're Judah and you hear the words have care now, you're going to shiver to your spine. Because another example of intertextuality, where have we heard the words have care now before? These words came out of Judah's own mouth when he held up a bloodied coat dipped in goat blood to his father, Joseph, a little while ago and said, have care now, recognize this coat. It's your son's. It's Joseph's. Hakerna. Recognize it. And that was the beginning of Joseph's descent into pain and grief. And now there's a lady calling upon him. Hakerna. Whose staff is this? Whose signet ring is this? Whose cloak is this? And now Judah has an opportunity to make amends. And he says, yes, they're mine. I recognize you and i stand up and i admit i am modder i'm a yehuda i admit to the part i played in this story and almost we have a moment of the return of the king it's a bit like aragorn is riding through the pages of the bible return of the king because why because what what are the signs of a king a staff a signet ring a cloak Tamar has taken them away from him. And now by him standing up and recognizing his role, recognizing what he didn't do and needed to do, the staff, the signet ring and the cloak, they returns to him the signs of his majesty. And so the story began with Yehuda going down and through his recognition, he's brought back up. And so recognition and respect are the heart of the second seduction story of Yibum in the book of Genesis. And as we learned, Boaz is the child of this story. And so we now have two stories. We have a story of kindness, which is twisted, which results in Moab and Ruth. We have a story of respect and recognition, which results in Boaz, the descendant of Judah and Peret. And those stories converge in the book that we will be reading in Shul on Friday, and please God, we'll be reading at home on Friday, the book of Ruth. So let's listen now. Let's listen together for echoes, for patterns in the stories that we've just heard as we read and, uh, and just go through some of the details in the story of Ruth. Now, the, one of the first things that Boaz recognizes in Ruth when he meets her is what? What's a word that he says about her many, many times? Anyone want to unmute and suggest what it is? She's kind. That's right, that's right, Helen. He says over again, for your kindness, I see your kindness. She goes to glean in the fields. She goes to glean in the fields and 
He says, you're kind. I see your kindness to your mother-in-law, Naomi. And even at the seduction story, which we'll see inside later on, he says, I see your kindness. Boaz recognizes something in her. There's that act of recognition. What's he recognizing? Her lineage, her lineage of kindness from Moab, the kindness that for them went wrong. But here there seems to be something quite nice about that kind, quite special about that kindness. And Boaz is recognizing it. Not only that, but there's a beautiful verse in the book of Ruth. And the book and, 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 the, and the verse is like this. She says to him when he says, when he says, I want to protect you, I want to look after you. So she says, Madua Matzachin Beinecha. Why have I found chain, grace in your eyes? Listen to this word, Lahaki Reini, Lahaki Reini, to recognize me. We heard that word before, haker now, recognize this staff, this signet ring, this cloak. And now Ruth is saying to Boaz, you're recognizing me. Why are you recognizing me? And I am foreign, nochriya. If you, re if you um, re reassemble the letters of nochriya, nun, chaf, reish, yud, hey, you actually get hakireini, that same word, recognize me. The challenge of recognition. Why are you recognizing me? I'm a stranger. How could I find favor? in your eyes but he doesn't see her simply as others see her he doesn't see her as a daughter of moab poor and low trying to join this people a foreigner in a foreign land he doesn't say that he says hugad hugadli korasha asit et khamatech i saw i it's, it's been told to me everything you did for your mother in law after the death of your husband and how you left your land. He sees the kindness which he did. And then he says something amazing. Yeshalem Hashem Palech. Hashem should reward your deeds. And he carries on and he says that you asher ba'at lachashot tachat kanafav. That God, the God that you've come to shelter beneath his wings, let him take care of you. Tachat kanafav, underneath the wings of God, let him take care of you. And so Boaz, like Judah, his ancestor, succeeds in recognizing that which is not easy to recognize, the depth of kindness. Just like Judah saw the depth, the purity of, of Tamar's intent, he saw through the subterfuge and saw what she wanted to achieve, the continuity of his family. So too Boaz sees the continuity, the, 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 the kindness that Ruth was showing. But it doesn't end there, because Boaz leaves the story at that point he gives her some food he's very nice he recognizes her he gives her a bracha but it feels like he's holding back just like Yehuda held back Yehuda could have given his third son to Tamar he could have ended the cycle he could have given her what she needed and Boaz can give could have given Ruth what she needed she needs him, but he holds back. He's good at the recognition, but he's not so good at the kindness. Well, when people are holding back and kindness is needed, we have a history of ladies taking the situation into their own hands. Lot's daughters took the situation into their own hands. Tamar takes the situation into her own hands. And now we have maybe Ruth taking the situation into her own hands. So let's just do a screen share for the final piece of text for today. Let's read the seduction story inside and let's hear the patterns that emerge. So we are in chapter three. We're almost there, my friends. You've been waking, waiting very, very nicely, but here we are. So Naomi says, I'm gonna have to seek a place for you. I'm going to have to see, seek for you a manoach, a resting place. What's, what's an interesting language for a husband? She's actually saying, I need you to find a husband. I need you to find a resting place. I can see that you are stuck and I'm going to have to find a resting place. And, and she doesn't seem to understand that what Ruth is really waiting for is she's really waiting for Boaz. So finally, they say, here's Boaz. Let's find out what's going here, Boaz, who's, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor tonight. So bathe, anoint yourself, dress up and go down to the threshing floor. It sounds a little bit like the way that Tamar dressed herself up, got ready 
for that evening, but don't tell anyone. Don't, don't disclose yourself to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. Eating and drinking. He's got a drink. Who had to drink before they got together? Well, that was Lot. And when he lies down, note the place where he lies down and go over to uncover his feet and lie down. And she says, I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. And she does it. She goes to the threshing floor. Boaz eats and drinks and he's in a cheery mood. And he lies down beside Ha'arema, the grain pile. That's a very interesting word for grain pile because the word ayin Reish Mem also means Arun, it means naked. Also, if you put together these words, these letters differently, Mem, Ayin, Reish, He, you get Ma'ara. What does Ma'ara mean in Hebrew? It means a cave. What else? What other seduction story happened in a cave? What other nakedness happened in a cave? Oh, that was Lot and his daughters. Vatavoy Valot, and she goes stealthily. That's an interesting word for stealth. Valot. What does that sound sound like? She goes lot like. She goes with a certain sense of lot. That ancestor of hers. And she lays by his feet. And there, Bachatzi Halaila, Bayacherad Haish, the man is, is scared by Yilafis, and he wakes up and there, Behine, Ishasha Cheves Miraglosov, a lady is sitting lying by his legs. Now, if you're Ruth at this point in time, if you're Ruth at this point in time, you don't have to start engaging in conversation. You're in there for seduction. You're in there to continue the cycle that has been going on in your history. But Ruth doesn't. Ruth doesn't. She breaks the cycle. She says, Anochi Rus. I'm Ruth. I'm not a masked harlot. I'm not masquerading as something other than who I really am. I am Ruth, Amasecha. And she says to him, Ufarasa Kanafecha, please spread out your kanaf, your cloak. Now, kanaf can mean cloak, but it can also mean spread your wings. Kanaf, spread your wings. Where did we hear the word wings in this story? Well, Boaz, when he recognized Ruth's goodness, gave her a bracha, gave her a blessing. Hashem should spread his wings over you. Ruth says, Boaz, it's time not just for the kindness of God. It's time for you to be kind. You recognize my kindness, but it's now time for you to spread your wings. You have to reach out in kindness. Because you are the redeemer. And here we go. And he says to her, you are blessed. La Hashem, Bitti, my daughter. Here we go. Your kindness, your latest deed of kindness. Ha'achor in this latest deed is greater than the first one. In that you've not turned to other people, you've turned to me. Your kindness to me, I recognize that kindness. And so we don't have seduction. I hate to disappoint you, Solly, but it all goes above board after this. After this story, they go to the base in the next day and they formalize the Yibum process in court, ensuring that there are no other contenders for the deed. Recognition meets true kindness. And from Boaz and Ruth, we have Ruth, we have Ruth, Ruth sorry, we have Oved. From Oved, we have Yishai. And from Yishai, we have King David. The stories have converged and have become redeemed in this story here. And so let's pull out the zoom lens and let's make some conclusions as we have chased away the lullabies, hopefully, of the Book of Ruth. And we come to answer our two questions. Why do we read the Book of Ruth on Shavuot? And what do we make of the seduction story? We've got two themes running through this story. We've got recognition of the other respecting the other, holding on to the existence of someone else. And we've also got kindness, kindness which is internal, or kindness which is imitated. And now we're looking at how they play and interplay with each other and interact with each other. And maybe the metaphor could be like this. We've got a foundation. We've got the foundations of a building, and then we have the structure that we build on top of it. At the foundation of any building, the foundation of any relationship is the recognition of an other. That you exist, that you have a right to exist, that you are not an extension of me, that rather you have something that needs respecting. That's what Judah does 
when ultimately he recognizes Tamar. He says, yes, you existed. It's not all about me and my story and my concerns. It's also about you. And I recognize that you have a right to my family. Of your, You have a right to this legacy. I respect you. And I will recognize you. And that's the foundation. That's the core of a relationship. And if you remember from Shavuot last year, when we investigated the Ten Commandments, we saw how the Ten Commandments ultimately boil down to respecting the existence of God as an other, as the other, and respecting the existence of our fellow man as others. And that the foundation of Judaism is built upon respecting others and noting that they have existence too and caring for their existence. But after we've respected the other, there's another step. It's not enough to simply say you exist and I value your existence. I now have to reach across the divide between you and me. Yes, you exist, but now there's a gap. And now kindness has to bridge that gap. Real kindness, true kindness, wholesome kindness. Both earlier stories had an ingredient of one without the other. The Lot story had kindness without any respect. It was all about Lot. Lot kind of knew what was going on. He kind of overextended himself so much that his daughters become his. There's no respect there. There's just kindness. Judah had respect. I know that this needs to happen, but I'm not willing to reach out. I'm not willing to give my son. Finally, the two stories converge in Ruth and Boaz, recognizing each other's value and then reaching across the divide wholesomely, carefully, with kindness and respect. Ruth's triumph is to champion kindness without being at the expense of recognition. And so why do we read this on Shavuot? We read this on Shavuot because we build a bedrock of recognition on those Ten Commandments, but we need to build from there with wholesome, healthy kindness. Kindness to God, kindness to other people. Now, I could finish with some sort of reflections about the kindness that we've seen at this time, but I think that I don't need to. I think take this message, take this idea, and see how it's living right now in our shul, in our community around the world. See how people are recognizing each other, they're respecting each other, and they're reaching out so wholesomely, so carefully. Ruth takes the Ten Commandments to the next level, a level of kindness with recognition. Thank you for chasing away the lullabies with me this evening. Stay tuned for next week as we look into the Book of Nassau and the Parents' Blessing. I'm going to stop the live stream. Oh, if there are any questions or comments, this would be a great uh, time. I, I have a question. Robert. Yes, Michael. If, if they wanted to continue the human race uh, yeah. and Lot had sexual relations with his daughters, yes? You're saying that, yeah? I'm saying that his daughters felt that there was no more. There were no more humans left. They, they, they thought they saw the destruction of, so of civilization. So therefore so they, they had sex with Lot, right? Yes. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm saying that. That's all right. Um, <laughs> well, you've said a lot to lie, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so therefore, if they if they became pregnant, surely um, in ch children from incest aren't always healthy children. I would have thought. I think you're right, Michael. But I suppose some children are better, or even uh, incest children or slightly damaged incest children are better than no children and no humans. So that they thought that no children, um, not having children was better than they thought that. Well, they thought having children was better than not having children. Okay. Even if those children might be somewhat genetically compromised. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure how well they were doing with, um, with genetics then anyway, um, particularly because there were lots of brothers and sisters marrying each other at that time. So it seems like, um, those peas in uh, Mendel's experiments weren't quite uh, at the level of uh, Lot's, uh, Lot's children, but I don't know. But uh, you're right. It's a good question. Isn't it about fair genetics. to say that there's, um, there's a fair degree of incest throughout the whole, uh, whole Torah? Yeah, that was, yeah, I was about to uh, Genetic proximity. There's plenty of people married to 
nieces, nephews, cousins, and all sorts of interrelations. That's true. That's true. So, yeah. Why do we, the, why do we never know Lot's, Lot's wife's name? Why is she always referred to as Lot's wife? Good question. It's a good question. You don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think she's just called Salty. I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. It's <laughs> Uh, did Judah did Judah withhold his third son from her, or yes, was he child. so young that the child was so, so young that she would have had to wait years? Before no, she waited. He... So, good question, Solly. So she waited. He he uh, reached Shelah, the third son, reached an age where he was now marriageable. Able. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then and then uh, nevertheless, she saw that he Judah still withheld not... him. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone, and uh, good night. Thank you, Rabbi.